Good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. We do have a couple of birthdays this week. So happy birthday to Carol Call on Thursday and Nancy on Friday. So be sure and wish them happy birthday. Leading our worship service this morning, Dan will have our scripture reading taken from Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. If you want to be turning there, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Frank will be leading our singing. Jim will lead the opening prayer. Paul and Kyle will lead the Lord's Supper Memorial and offer prayer for our giving. Bud will lead our closing prayer. Jamie's in the AV booth, and Jerry will be speaking for us this morning. Thanks to Joe and JC for your excellent lessons last Sunday, and thank you to Dan for your excellent devotional on Wednesday. Potter Children's Home coin cans are due today. If you'd still like to help, you can give a check to Frank or Dan. Brunch Fellowship Meal is today following the morning services, so we invite and encourage everyone to stay for that fellowship meal. Elders, deacons, and preachers meeting is this afternoon at 4 p.m. in the multi-purpose room. And Matt said the next evangelism class will be on Saturday, September 10th at 10 a.m. here at the building. St. Louis area-wide lectureship, September 15th through the 17th at our building this year, and Matt is serving as the director. Ladies' Day here at St. Peter's is scheduled for Saturday, uh, October 29th. Saturday, October 29th, Cindy Baker and Shanna will be speaking. Please check the bulletin for a complete listing of those on our prayer list at this time. Please continue to remember Mary Lou, Penny, and Jay McCafferty with their ongoing treatments. Tish Clark had a brain tumor removed on Thursday. BJ reported she will be in neuro ICU for a few days recovering, so please keep the Clarks in your prayers. Del Cochran had surgery to have another stent inserted into his heart on Friday, so please remember him. Randy and Maria Smith are doing better, and Charles said that Maria's oxygen level went down so low that Randy had to uh, take her to ER for recharging, but she seems to be doing better after that. And then Darlene reports that James Wilson continues to face multiple health issues, and right now it's with his lungs. So please remember James in your prayers as well. We'll now begin with our scripture reading. Dan. Again, that scripture reading is Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. First song is, There's Sunshine in My Soul Today. There's sunshine in my soul today.
song before the opening prayer is Humble Yourself. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do humble ourselves before you. We're amazed at the great things you have done. We're amazed at the creation that you have made for us. We're amazed at all the things that come our way. We're amazed at your love. We know, Lord God, that we don't deserve your grace, but we are so thankful for receiving it. We pray that each person will take a hold of that gift, accept it, and do your will. We know, O Lord God, that there's many things in this world to distract us and to keep us from doing the things that we should. But let us dwell upon you. Let us remember your son, to remember his teaching, remember his example. Remember the great sacrifice and death that he underwent and the resurrection that is a promise to us all. And we keep those things focused in our mind, O oh Lord, we'll be able to make sure that we do the things necessary for us to be with you one day in heaven. And we know that that has to be our goal of all things in our life that uh, we have before us and things that we want and things that, that we need, that is most of all. And we thank you, Lord God, that we have so many people here who are like-minded, that are Christians, that want to do your will and want to be with you in heaven. And as we do so and go about our lives, as we raise our children to believe in you and to love you and to do your will, let us continue to be strong. Let us continue to be courageous. Let us continue to be the people that you want us to be. We pray for all those on our prayer list that are having health problems and medical difficulties. There are so many that have been healed and getting better, and we thank you for that. But we know there's many more that we still need to keep in our prayers and to think about. We thank you, Lord God, for, for the healing hand you give those through the medical world that we have today. We pray also, Lord, for those that should be here this morning that have chosen not to. 
we, we know there's, there's many that have medical problems and they can't be with us, but there are others that are having spiritual problems. And we pray for them and we hope that we can be an encouragement to them and be able to help them to understand that we need to be here together. We need, to, we need the encouragement. We need the strength that we get from each other. And we need to be doing your will. We always ask the Lord that you forgive us our sins, help us to be uh, better at resisting temptation. And Lord, each and every day, we thank you for our families and the opportunity we have to love and, and care for each other. We pray for people around the world that are in difficulties and, and, and strife, that uh, they will be coming into a time of peace at some point, and that uh, you will help those that are in need. Be with our missionaries. We have so many around the world that are uh, out doing your work, uh, spreading the gospel, going into all corners of the earth. We pray for them and their families and their, and their success. And we certainly pray, Lord, for our people here. We look forward to the message of this hour and the opportunity we have to, to worship you together and to be able to remember your son as we go through this time. Be with us all and help us and encourage us, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Song of invitation is only a step after the lesson. Song before the lesson will be, I will call upon the Lord. Shall we stand as we sing the song? Thank you, Frank. For the month of August, our sermon series has been on questions about the Church of Christ. And that stems from various misunderstandings, misconceptions, that people have about the Church of Christ. We have so far looked at four of those things, and this morning we'll look at another one, and there's five more that we will deal with this evening. We encourage you certainly to be back for that. In the month of September, if you noticed in the bulletin, in case you did not notice it, but I'm sure you did. I'm sure everybody reads the bulletin. <coughs> right. I know how to, sometimes people will ask about, well, what about this or what about that? Or my response, it's in the bulletin. 
And, and so, but anyway, for the month of September, um, our series were, is entitled Hebrews, the Word of Exhortation. And that's based upon Hebrews 13 and verse 22. There are many statements in the book of Hebrews that are statements of exhortation, statements of encouragement. And so we'll be looking at various passages of Scripture from the book of Hebrews. Again, I remind you that as we address this subject for this month, and whoever was speaking, including myself, that we are not speaking for every person who is a member of the Church of Christ. We are not speaking for every congregation of God's people. And really it's not a matter of what does the Church of Christ believe or what does the Church of Christ teach or what does the Church of Christ practice. What needs to be emphasized is what does God in His Word authorize us to believe, to teach, and to practice. It is not the church that determines what the truth is that is to be believed, or that is to be taught, or that is to be practiced. It's the truth that is given to us that determines those matters. Just mention the words Church of Christ. And I know this is especially true in many places, in the, especially in the South. The response is going to be, oh yeah, I, I, know, I know that bunch of people. You know, they were started by Alexander Campbell. You, you know, they don't really believe in the grace of God. You, know, you do know that they don't even really believe in the Old Testament. And not only that, you understand that they believe that they are the only ones right. In other words, they're the only ones going to heaven. And how about this one? The Church of Christ. Oh, yes, I've had conversation with many of those people. They are bigoted in their thinking. They are so narrow-minded. They are basically legalists. All they're concerned about is doing exactly what the Bible says. Whether your heart is in the right condition or not. So all that matters with them is the action. Don't worry about the attitude. In John 17, and verse 17, thy word is truth. In Matthew chapter 28, and verse 18, Jesus said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now notice that Jesus said, all authority. Now 
Now, Jesus was sort of narrow-minded there when he said, all authority is given to me. Truth in its very nature is narrow. It is confining. It is restrictive. It is exclusive. The simple illustration, two plus two is what? A teacher may ask one of our students, come up to the board, if they have boards anymore, I don't know what they got, but probably not. Get out your whatever, type of whatever, punch whatever. And so here's little Susie, and she says to little Susie, what do you think two plus two is? She said, well, I think it is five. And you know, you can't tell somebody that they're wrong. That's going to make them feel bad. You have to be tolerant. You have to be acceptive of whatever anybody says anymore. I think it's five. Well, why do you think it's five? That's what mom and daddy has taught me. That's what grandpa, grandma, that's what they have taught me. So I think it is five. And she says to little Susie, no, it's four. And little Susie begins to cry, you know. Somebody told her she's wrong about something. But then little Susie reminds the teacher, you ask me what I think it is. And I think it is five. Little Susie, this probably sounds more like a little Johnny, turns to her teacher and I said, now teacher, do you know everything? And of course she said, no. Well, how do you know it's not five? Now two plus two is four. I, it's not six, seven, one, two, whatever. It is exclusive. Truth is always narrow. In our lesson this morning, we will be emphasizing the fact that truth is absolute. And number two, that truth is authoritative. And since truth is absolute, and since it is authoritative, then it must be accepted and applied to our lives. When I teach, when I preach, when I practice, the very same thing that Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Son of God, proclaimed and practiced, that is not wrong. I don't care what words you may use to describe that. That is not wrong. Remember, it is he who has all authority. It is he who said, in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man, Cometh unto the Father, 
but by me. Notice the truth that Jesus declared on that occasion. Notice how exclusive it is. Notice how confining it is. Notice how narrow it is. Jesus said, I am the way. You want access to the Father? Jesus says, I am the way. And if you don't follow me, the way, to gain access to the Father, then that means you are wandering around hopelessly, helplessly, and never gaining access to the Father. And Jesus said, it is me. Is there some other way? Is there some other one that we can go through to get to the Father? No, Jesus says, it is me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man can come unto the Father but by me. Try placing someone else there. And see where that gets you. Only by me can you have access to the Father. In Hebrews chapter 5, the Hebrew writer says, beginning in verse 8, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, complete, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. If I were to ask you, what does the Bible teach in reference to the one that is the author, that is the source, that is the cause of eternal salvation. Biblically, how would you answer? Are there some options you can pick there? Are there some multiple choices? That's what many people do today. That there are various ways, there are various roads that we can travel to get to the Father. But that road, that path, that way is narrow. It is exclusive, confining, to Jesus himself. The Hebrew writer says that he is the author, the source, the cause of eternal salvation. And when we choose to follow any other, or our own way in hope to getting access to the Father, it's not going to work. But notice also in that passage, in Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, notice it says that he is the author of eternal salvation. Unto all. Let 
Yes, God's love is as broad as a human race. God's grace has been extended to all. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12. You know the verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world. That's me, that's you, that's everyone else who has ever lived and who will live in the future. And so God's love is as broad as the human race. His grace has been extended to all. And He, from the very foundation, in fact, before the foundation of the world, put in place a plan, in fact, the plan, by which man could be saved. And Jesus is the cause. He is the source of that. No one else, nothing else will work. So Hebrew writer says that he is the author of, of eternal salvation unto how many? To all. How many did Jesus die for? Hebrews 2 and verse 9. Well, he died for all. How many did he shed his blood for? For all of mankind. It was not in any shape or form a limited atonement. He died for all. He's the author of, a sal of eternal salvation unto all them that, what's the next word? Obey Him. When I stress to people, when you stress to people, when we teach, when we proclaim to people, there has to be obedience. If we expect to be saved by God and therefore have access to the Father. That's what the Bible teaches. Don't give me this, well, I think that's no good. Or I feel that's no good. I wish that's no good. I know because I feel it in my heart. That's no good. But I know because that's what the Bible teaches. Now, people may not like it, and many don't. People may not agree with that. Many don't. But that's what the Bible teaches. Salvation made available to all. And Jesus is the cause. He is the source. He is the means by which that salvation can be obtained and we can have that hope of gaining access to the Father. While we're on this point, As you think about what Jesus proclaimed. Again, I emphasize to you. It's never wrong to proclaim what Jesus proclaimed. And therefore, we, as we follow in the steps of our Lord, as we proclaim and as we teach the truth, 
and understanding by its very nature. It is combining. It is exclusive. Salvation. Jesus, the author of, is, I get this word, is conditional. You know why so many people may look at those who are members of the Church of Christ by saying, you know, they are, they are, they're so narrow-minded. And what they mean by that is they want to do what the Bible says in Bible ways. Call Bible things by Bible names. And they're always stressing obedience. And they're forgetting about the grace of God. They're forgetting about the love of God. Have I forgotten about the grace of God this morning in my lesson? Have I forgotten about the love of God this morning in my lesson? You can never forget about the love of God or the grace of God. Yes, it is wide as a human race. It reaches out to all. But that does not mean that God's love and God's grace will accept and give everyone and anyone access to the Father apart from their obedience. That's not happening. Not because that's what Jerry Joseph just said, but that's what Jesus, that's what Jesus said. In John 8, 24, you know the passage. Jesus said, If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now think about this. Every accountable being is either going to die in their sins or be delivered from their sins. And dying in our sins means we're going to be, what? Separated from God forever. Isaiah 59 Verse 1 through 2. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Now notice that verse. You know, we, we, we quote that verse often about we are to believe. That's true. But look more closely at what is found in that verse. Jesus said, some will die in their sins. Now, I'm not making that up. That's what Jesus said. There is that possibility of a person dying in their sins. If they die in their sins, they're eternally separated from God. If they continue, of course, in that sinful state. Now, if it is possible for a person to die in their sins and they continue in that state... Will they be gaining access to the Father? 
That's impossible. Because they die separated from God in their sins. So, if that be the case, and it is, then can I ask this question? Is everyone gaining access to the Father? Oh, yes, I know about the grace of God. We preach it. We teach it. We believe in it. And God provides that which we cannot provide for ourselves, but God will not by and through His grace do for us what we choose not to do for ourselves. You see, salvation is conditional, yes. Jesus so states by that verse, John 8, 24. How about Luke 13, 3? I tell you nay, but except you repent, it shall all likewise perish. There is a perishing state that one can reach. How does that come about? If they, what? Will not repent. In Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33, you know the passage. And Jesus talks about those who will deny him, he will deny before the Father. But those who will confess him, he will confess them before the Father. So those who deny him, he's going to deny before the Father. Does that sound like I am gaining access to the Father? Jesus said, I will deny you. Mark 16, Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. Do you see any conditions? Well, see, salvation is conditional. And Jesus so taught by the very fact of those things that he demanded of people. And he has the right to do that because of what? He has all authority. And he's a way by which we can have access to the Father. Salvation. Jesus is the cause, source of salvation. Is what is conditional. And if it is conditional, and it is, then salvation involves my individually choosing. To have it or not to have it. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 1, verse 28, Come unto me. Notice again how exclusive that is. Come unto me, all ye labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn to me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. So my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, that's an invitation suggesting a choice that I can make. He's not saying, I'm going to force you to accept this. No. Come. 
That's a choice. That's a choice. In John chapter 5, when Jesus was pointing out to the people and giving forth evidence and proof that he was the Christ, the Son of God. And one of those proofs that he gave was, John 5, 39, he talked about search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life, and they are that which testify of me. One source of proof that I am who I claim to be is the scripture because they testify of me. Now, verse 40 he says, And ye will not come unto me. See, that's a choice that some Jesus was talking to were making on that occasion. And ye will not come to me. Notice that ye might have life. Did it matter whether they came to him or not and in receiving life? Now you can't read that passage. And if you have one eye open, at least half awake, when you read that passage, Jesus says, if you don't come to me, you can't have life. But it's a choice you make. Conditions. Oh yeah, salvation is conditional. Therefore, salvation is connected to choices that we must make. And salvation, please note the confinement of it. It is Christ-centered. He's the cause of that salvation. He's our hope of heaven. It is by and through Him we can be reconciled to God. That's what He wants. So the invitation is extended because he wants to provide spiritual blessings to all and we can come to read about that and come to know that based upon the truth based upon the truth Jesus was narrow in his teaching, when he came to access to the Father, he was narrow in his teaching when he came to authority. All authority is given to me, heaven and earth. I so said, when it comes to deciding what we are to do in worship, just reading those words found in John 4, 24, where Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Is that passage confining? Yes. Our worship must be directed to whom? To God. In truth. So when we teach, rightfully so, by the authority of Jesus himself, that when we come to worship God, God has stipulated exactly how we're to do that and what we are to do. And how about our walk in life? Was our Lord narrow in that?
Read the Sermon on the Mount. Study the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And see if there's anything in those three chapters that would suggest to us that Jesus was narrow in his teaching. You know the answer. And then toward the end of that sermon, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not everyone is going to gain access to the Father. Oh, we may do a lot of religious stuff. Be involved in a lot of religious things. But Jesus said, and when I teach what Jesus said here on this matter of salvation, how can I be wrong? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone is going to make it. But he that doeth. You can't get around that word. The will of my Father, which is in heaven. Yes, in Matthew 7, 13 through 14, Jesus reminds us that we have a choice. We have a choice in life. What way, what path, what road we are going to choose to walk on While we are alive. There is that broad way. That leads to destruction. But straight is the gate and narrow is the way. That leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. When you look at that passage, Jesus says there's two ways, and each person must choose, because you see there are two destinies. There is destruction at the end of one of those paths that we may choose to, to live, to walk on if we were in life, but the other one. There is deliverance. There's life. Jesus makes it clear. In John 8, <coughs> beginning in verse 31. Jesus said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. The word continue. Does that have anything to do with obedience? And so if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples, followers? Then are ye my disciples, followers of me? What if I choose, and I can, not to continue? You see, Jesus, very exclusive there, 
If you're going to continue to be my disciple, you've got to continue in my word. That's what he says. So if I don't continue in his word, then I'm not remaining a disciple, a follower of his. Now that's truth. That's what is stated explicitly, and that's also what is stated by implication. We look at that passage. And then verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If we obey the word of God without being concerned about the condition of our heart, then that is legalism. And Jesus himself rejects that. It's not enough just to obey the word. It's not enough just to do the right acts. There must be the attitude. The attitude. There must be our heart being involved in that. You remember? Paul said in Romans chapter 6, 16 through 18, how that they were once, of course, in sin, but they have obeyed from the heart. Notice there's obedience from the heart. And that's the way it is with us today. That's what the Lord demands. Sometimes people are not so concerned about the action or the acts. They're more concerned with the heart. Well, that's wrong too. There must be the attitude, proper attitude, with proper action. And that's what results into a person becoming obedient to the gospel of Christ in their faith, repenting of their sins, confessing Christ and being baptized. And they began to walk in that newness of life. Romans 6 and verse 3 through 6. Because you see, a change has been made. Salvation it's conditional. Salvation involves choice, choosing on our part. But in salvation, when we do that, there is change. Matthew 18, 3. Except ye be converted. What is that? That's change. That's change. And then we can have confidence. We can have confidence. Not based upon how we feel. But confidence based upon what the Lord has said here in this book. And I can feel good about that. You see, when a person says, well, I feel good about this. That doesn't mean anything. When I have obeyed the word, the result of that is feeling good. Remember those people in the, day, in the, the book of Acts? We read about specifically stating after they are being baptized, they were what? Rejoicing. Now the rejoicing didn't occur before they were being baptized. 
that feeling of feeling good, rejoicing did not occur before they were baptized. But it's the faith that acts upon his word that results in that feeling of joy, of happiness, and confidence. And a person can have that even this morning if you haven't obeyed the gospel. We have emphasized in our lesson what's involved in that. And as Brother Frank is about ready to lead us in this song, we encourage you, if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you're not a child of God, if your sins have not been forgiven you, the way, the plan, the means has been made available. And we have to make that choice. We have to make that choice. If you're here this morning, you are a child of God. But in your life, you have made some choices that have hurt you spiritually. Sin is in your life again. That's not just taken care of automatically by the love or by the grace of God. The Lord through His Word reminds us that we have to repent of those things. We have to confess those things. And if we will pray, and we will pray with you and for you, the Lord will forgive. There is no other way. Why not come as together we stand and as we sing? for Lord's Supper, we'll be singing number 742.
when I survey the wondrous cross. Then we'll have the Lord's Supper. Father in heaven, we thank you for this bread, this symbol of your son's body that was hung on the cross for our sins. Lord, please be with us as we take this emblem that we might take it in a manner which is pleasing in your sight. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this cup, which represents your son's blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. And we pray that those taking it, take it in a manner pleasing your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Apart from the Lord's Supper, the elders have set aside this time to fulfill another of the commandments. Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you provide for us in our daily lives. We thank you for our jobs, our, our families, all the material blessings that you provide for us. Lord, please be with each one of us as we give back a portion of that to help further the work of your church. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
the closing song this morning is Ring Out the Message. So we stand as we sing the song and remain standing for the closing prayer. Would you please bow with me as we go to God in prayer? Most kind and loving Heavenly Father, we're so appreciative of this Lord's Day morning that you've blessed us with, that we've had an opportunity to assemble together to worship you. Father, we thank you for the message that we've heard, and we pray that we take it to heart and will help us to go out into the world and to uh, show others how much you love us and them and that they would come to know and to love you as they should. And Father, we ask that you be with us. As we, as we end this service. And Father, we ask that you also continue to remain with us as we enjoy the fellowship we have one with another uh, after we're done, that we meet in a fellowship room. And Father, we're just thankful for all that you do for us and that we're grateful for the food that you bless us with. And, and Father, we're just thankful for your son and for all the gifts that you give us. All this we ask in his name. Amen.